Your hair is going gray. This glitch may explain why. Experiments using mice found a malfunction in adult stem cells that offers insights into why we turn into silver foxes and vixens. Many of the signs of aging are invisible, slow, and subtle, changes in cell division capacity, cardiac output and kidney function don't exactly show up in the mirror, but gray hairs are one of the most obvious clues that the body isn't working like it used to. Our hair turns gray when melanin-producing stem cells stop functioning properly. A new study in mice but with implications for people and published Wednesday in the journal Nature, provides a clearer picture of the cellular glitches that turn us into silver foxes and vixens. This is a really big step toward understanding why we gray said Mayumi Ito, an author of the study and a dermatology professor at New York University's Grossman School of Medicine. Unlike embryonic stem cells, which develop into all sorts of different organs, adult stem cells have a more set path. The melanocyte stem cells in our hair follicles are responsible for producing and maintaining the pigment in our hair. Each hair follicle keeps immature melanocyte stem cells in storage. When they are needed, those cells travel from one part of the follicle to another, where proteins spur them to mature into pigment-producing cells, giving hair its hue. Scientists assumed that gray hair was the result of that pool of melanocyte stem cells running dry. However, previous studies with mice made DR. Ito and her co-author, Kisun, wonder if hair could lose its pigment even when stem cells are still present. To learn more about stem cell behavior throughout different phases of hair growth, the researchers spent two years tracking and imaging individual cells in mouse fur. To their amazement, the stem cells traveled back and forth within the hair follicle, transitioning into their mature, pigment-producing state and then out of it again. We were surprised, said Dr. Sun, who said seeing one group of stem cells switching back and forth between mature and young states did not match up with existing explanations. But as time wore on, the melanocyte cells couldn't keep up the double act. A hair falling out and growing back takes a toll on the follicle, and eventually, the stem cells stopped making their journey, and thus, stopped receiving protein signals to make pigment. From then on, the new hair growth didn't get its dose of melanin. The researchers further explored this effect by plucking hairs from mice, simulating a faster hair growth cycle. This forced aging led to a buildup of melanocyte stem cells stuck in their storage place, no longer producing melanin. The mice's fur went from dark brown to salt and pepper. While the study was conducted with rodents, the researchers say their findings should be relevant to how human hair gets and loses its color. What's more, they hope their findings could be a step toward preventing or reversing the graying process. Melissa Harris, a biologist at the University of Alabama at Birmingham who was not involved with the study, said the findings help clinch previous evidence she's seen suggesting that not all melanocyte stem cells are created equal, and even if you have some left over, they may not be useful. Dr. Harris said she takes the study's findings about its forced aging of mouse hair with maybe a little bit of a grain of salt as a plucked hair might not behave the same as naturally aged hair, but she found the study valuable, not just because a cure for graying hair might be a hit with the public. The insights into stem cell behavior might help researchers understand things like cancer and cell regeneration. I think sometimes people take the hair for granted, she said, but in a sense, it makes it actually really easy for us to see potential ways in which aging or other perturbations affect our bodies. Changing cells, aging bodies. Miriam Gorospe views aging through a molecular lens to help lengthen health span. Each moment of life, the environment contributes to changes in our bodies at the cellular and molecular levels that can greatly affect our overall health. From toxins and nutrients to natural limits on cellular replication, Miriam Gorospe, Ph.D., and her team have dedicated nearly 15 years to studying the fundamental mechanisms of growing older. Considering the range of effects that aging has on the body and its myriad organs, tissues, and cells, understanding why we all don't live healthy and happy forever is no simple feat.
fish fluorescence in situ hybridization of the senescence associated LNC or not hot air in human diploid fibroblasts. The study of aging could be considered daunting since it's so broad Goros Pay says. On the other hand, it means we have a wide canvas on which to examine the questions we are most interested in. In our lab, we approach the study of aging from the perspective of the cell, focusing on a range of aging processes, some of which are pathological, but many of which are simply physiological and just as poorly understood. Kot Babdel Mosin, Ph.D., prepares radioactive DNA probes to investigate the abundance of long non-coding urnas in senescent cells using northern blot analysis. One of Boros Pay team's research focus areas is cellular senescence, a natural state of permanent cell cycle arrest reached when cells stop dividing, usually after 50 or so divisions. Cellular senescence was discovered four decades ago, but scientists still don't fully understand why it happens. One of the most widely accepted explanations is that the ends of each cell's chromosomes called telomeres shorten a little during each replication and at some point signal the cell to stop dividing in order to protect itself from potential damage. The cells don't necessarily die as a result, but they can no longer divide and function like younger, healthy cells. Myriam Gorospe, Ph.D. Amarish Panda, Ph.D. Center, and Rongo, Ph.D. Right plan next experiments involving erna sequencing. As we age, along with the reduced capacity to divide, our cells progressively lose their ability to function optimally, and these changes are often associated with development of age-related diseases, Goros Pay says. One example that I think most people can relate to is diabetes. As we grow old, our body's ability to quickly react to changing glucose levels in our bloodstream is gradually impaired. So, as we age into our 50s, 60s, and 70s we start to see more and more diabetes. One of the questions my group studies is why this decline happens. Cultured muscle cells are used to investigate the process of muscle differentiation, myogenesis which is impaired with advancing age. Studies are underway to investigate age-associated erna-binding proteins and long non-coding urnas that influence myogenesis. To gain further insight into this question, a former researcher in Goros Pei's lab, Yun Kyung Lee, Ph.D., studied the responses of cultured pancreatic beta cells to high levels of glucose in the culture medium. The team discovered that in response to high glucose, the erna binding protein HUD was released from the insulin M erna, allowing the insulin M erna to be made into protein and causing insulin levels to rise. When the group further investigated insulin levels in animals that overexpressed the HUD gene, they found markedly reduced levels of insulin, suggesting that abnormally high HUD levels or function could underlie some cases of age related diabetes. Protein concentration as measured using the Bradford assay. Moving this research forward will require collaboration, including clinical investigation with patients who have developed age-related diabetes a challenging task for many basic science laboratories to consider yet Goros Pay is excited at the prospect of translating their findings from the bench to the bedside. Dr. Goros Pei and Ji Hyun Yoon, Ph.D. Examine neurons using fluorescence microscopy. Here, erna binding proteins are investigated in order to understand the molecular basis of Alzheimer's disease. It's gratifying to work in an environment where we are allowed to focus on our area of expertise but very much encouraged to collaborate across disciplines so that we can study these questions holistically Goros Pay says. In our lab, we focus on molecular and cellular biology, but when we have questions that require additional resources or expertise, technical or biological, we simply go to our collaborators downstairs or a few doors away. Because our resources are shared, there is no real competition. We are all working together towards a common goal. In my mind, with this approach, we are much more likely to find the answers to aging as healthily as possible that we are all ultimately seeking. Myriam Gorospe, Ph.D is a senior investigator and chief of the ERNA regulation section in the Laboratory of Genetics at the National Institute on Aging. National Institute on Aging, NIA. Scientific Director. 
Luigi Ferrucci, MD, PhD. The Intramural Research Program, RP, in the NIA provides a stimulating academic setting for a comprehensive effort to understand aging through multidisciplinary investigator-initiated research. The program includes the scientific disciplines of biochemistry, cell and molecular biology, genetics, physiology, immunology, neuroscience, neurogenetics, behavioral sciences, psychology, cognition, psychophysiology, epidemiology, statistics and clinical research and the medical disciplines of neurobiology, immunology, endocrinology, cardiology, rheumatology, hematology, oncology, and gerontology. Medical problems associated with aging are pursued in depth using the tools of modern laboratory and clinical research. The central focus of the research is understanding age-related changes in physiology and the ability to adapt to environmental stress. This understanding is then applied to developing insight about the pathophysiology of age-related diseases.